I want to welcome you to our midweek service for Graceway Baptist Church. And as usual, I want to remind you to pray for our church and pray for one another. We've got a lot of things going on, a lot of people facing some different crises in their health, a lot of COVID lately. Uh, we've actually had more during this uptick in the COVID spike than we did all of 2020. And um, we also have people in the hospital like Steve Elkins and pray for him. And just as you look at that, go to the newsletter at www.gracewayokc.org. And when you get to our church website, you will see across the top, there's a thing called events up there. You can do that. You'll get a drop down menu and you can open up the newsletter and you can print that off or whatever you want to do. But uh, that'll keep you aware of events that are happening in the church. And it will also tell you about uh, people that need your prayer. And if you would like to uh, get on the prayer list, be sure and uh, call the office and uh, talk to uh, anyone there that can help you and can get your name put in the newsletter. We don't just automatically or magically know that. Sometimes we see some things on social media, Facebook or something like that, but other times we don't and we might miss something. Just make sure that you, uh, if you wanna be on the newsletter, on the prayer list, be sure that you let us know and don't just assume that we do know because we would not knowingly keep anybody or anything off of that prayer list. Um, sometimes the network doesn't connect all the way through. So uh, please do that for us. Also want to uh, thank you for your giving and encourage you to continue to give regularly and systematically to the work of the church. That's a biblical thing to do and God will bless you for it. And it's also a necessary thing because no matter what season of the year it is, no matter uh, whether people are attending or not, we still have bills to pay. We've got to pay salaries and insurance and utilities and all of those kind of things, and they don't change during the summer or any other time. So keep up with all of that. You can do online giving if that helps you, or you have your uh, set amount deducted every week or every two weeks or every month, as the case may be. And you can also uh, mail it in by uh, snail mail, 1100 Southwest 104th Street, Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, 73139. And uh, we really do appreciate that and want to encourage you to continue to do so. Um, we also are keeping an eye on, on things as pertains to COVID. We kind of thought we were through all of this, and I think most people did too. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen if it's already kind of spiking. I heard this morning that Mercy Hospital is already out of bed space. And uh, don't know if it's going to be like 2020 or not. We don't know what kind of regulations or uh, you know state of emergency or anything is going to come. And uh, we'll just trust the Lord to see us through this and give us wisdom as time goes by. Thank you for understanding and Thank you so much for your patience in all of this. You know, sometimes I think people look maybe at us and other businesses and things like that and say, well, what's the consistency? And here, here's the thing that is a little bit frustrating to us is there is none. And it seems like whenever you look at the CDC website, what you read at the top of it is kind of contradicted by what's at the bottom or at least confuses it and so we're not always just really really sure and what one church does um, you know we kind of look at and we pay attention to what the other churches are doing and we pay attention to the recommendation of um, you know our leaders but ultimately it comes down to what we decide to do and we try to do what we feel will honor the Lord enable us to continue our mission and also that will be the best for you in the congregation. So in other words, we don't know what we're doing sometimes, but I don't think the government does or anyone else does either, but we just try to do the best we can 
with the information that we have, and we do that with um, a sense of wanting to do the best and help people and keep people safe and at the same time not compromise who we are. Boy, that's a lot of rambling there, but I think maybe you get what we're trying to say there. Now, we've been looking on Wednesday nights, of course, through various psalms. We're going to finish up Psalm 46 today. And uh, the title of the message is, Let Your Doctrine Be Your Guide. Obviously, I got that from the old cliche, Let Your Conscience Be Your Guide. I'm going to replace the word conscience with doctrine. And the reason that I say that is because... Um, People tend to say the right things about God. He's a loving God, compassionate God, an all-powerful God, an all-knowing, ever-present God. He's sovereign. We'll say all of those kind of things. And we'll say amen to those things, and we'll sing those things, and we'll teach those things. And then a crisis hits, and we hit the panic button. Something's wrong with that. Something doesn't go our way, and all of a sudden we are questioning everything, and we are coming apart. And I think the reason we do that is because what we say about God and what we really believe and act on about God may be two different things. And we've got to get those things together. What we believe about God, what we put down on paper about God, what we affirm about God really should be the guide for our everyday life. Whether times are really good or whether times are really bad. And human nature and the depravity thereof, uh, it doesn't really matter because you would think that um, somebody has a crisis in their life, what are they gonna do? Well, naturally, naturally they would just turn to God. Well, hold on, not so fast. A lot of people don't. A lot of people, when a crisis comes, they run from God, they abandon God. They say, how could a good God do something like this or allow something like this. I won't serve him anymore. And they unhook and they unhitch from church, from the Bible, um, in lifestyle, all of those kind of things. Hey, our church is not exempt from that. And those of you who have been around Grace for, Graceway for a while can probably name some names. I could too. And so then we think, well, if it's in the worst of times, that people abandon God instead of seek after God and depend upon God, then maybe if God would just bless us, make us healthy, make us wealthy, and make everything to just really go our way, then we would really serve the Lord. Well, again, not so fast, because we've seen tons of people that are prospered, and as their prosperity increases, their need for God diminishes. And so there are some people that when they are poor, when they are needy, they cry out to God because it's the only thing they know to do. It's the only place they know to go. And then they're prospered, and then they don't need God anymore. They don't pray for daily bread because they don't need to pray for daily bread. And they take their life into their own hands because, well, they've got options for the first time in their life. They've got the money, they've got the time, They've got the kind of job that can let them set their own schedule and there's almost nothing that they cannot do. And those kind of people tend a lot of times not to give as much as they ought to give, sadly, and also not to be as available to the people in the church as they once were. And we've seen people that as they advance and become upwardly mobile, they don't have time to teach Sunday school. They don't have time to work in Awanas. They don't have time to be a deacon. They don't have time to serve as they should as an elder and those kind of things, and it gets very, very sad. However, we can't predict either one of these things because I have seen people that when things turn sour, they actually did turn to the Lord, and I've seen people that when things were very, very good, they were humble and grateful and thanking God and using their time and their resources as an opportunity to serve God, not to back away from him. We're so inconsistent. You know, when I was talking about some of this stuff with COVID and all the different things that scientists say and doctors say and the CDC says and the government says, all of that, 
hey, we're 20 times that bad in our own personal life. Which way are we going to go? What does God have to do to get our attention and to get us to be solid in our walk with God? Because if he withdraws blessings, sometimes what happens? We run, we unhitch, we're done with him. If he pours the blessings on, then we become self-sufficient and we don't need him. And so the idea of thinking that whether I'm a multimillionaire or whether I'm homeless on the streets, it's still true. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. And uh, that's something that we have trouble getting together. And one of the great examples of this is a person who made the statement, when everything was going great for me, in my pride, I said, the Lord has blessed me and made my mountains stand strong. But then you hid your face and I was dismayed. And you know who I'm talking about there? That's a paraphrase of Psalm 30. I'm talking about the man after God's own heart, King David. He had trouble being consistent, just like you have trouble being consistent. And we can always think about our present situation and say, yeah, but if this were to change, I'd be a better person, I'd be a better Christian, I would be more faithful. But that's not always true, is it? We don't always understand ourselves even because we can bounce around so much that it is not even funny. Even David had trouble with that. So one of the things we ought to strive for is to be consistent. Now the reason we need to be consistent is not just so our lives will make more sense and um, we don't make things worse. Our lives need to be consistent because we have a testimony to uphold. Now, I can tell you that there are any number of children that grow up in church, even grow up in preacher's homes, Sunday school teacher's homes, deacon's homes, that, that type of thing, who just are not real interested in the things of God and they're certainly not interested in the church right now. Why is that? Because they saw in their parents this lack of consistency. They would see their parents acting one way at church, treating people the way at church that would be socially acceptable and all of that, but they didn't treat their own family members that way once they got in the car or once they got home. They would see mom or dad use a certain vocabulary at church that didn't match the vocabulary at home. Four-letter words and crudities and vulgarities and just plain old cussing, that kind of stuff. And they would uh, listen to people at church, listen to their parents at church talk about the lovey-dovey side of Christianity and how beautiful and how wonderful everything is and then go home and tear the preacher apart, tear the sermon apart, tear the people apart and in seeing all of that, you know what they did? They said, unhitch me from this. I don't want anything to do with it because consistency is the jewel in our lives. And I think that a good definition of sanctification is not only growing in the Lord or God making us holy, which is certainly true. I think it could be said, you could make a case for sanctification is God making you and me consistent in our Christian life. And so let your doctrine be your guide. What you say you believe and what you stand up for and what you argue for, I've seen some people argue about Calvinism and I'll just tell you, for me, I'm not doing that anymore. I've lost friends and I push people away and all of that, I'm just not interested in doing that. I'll answer questions and I'll talk and have a discussion, but once it starts getting heated and it's clear that the other person is deeply rooted in what they believe and they're not really teachable and they just want to argue or to try to change me, then, you know, we're done with all of that. Uh, there are lots of things that we argue for and we get upset about and we try to call it contending for the faith. And then what happens? Well, if we're not really living what we say we believe, you know, they'll, they'll see it. They'll see it. And if you believe that God is a good God and God is also a sovereign God, then you can't abandon either one of those things 
when life doesn't go the way that you planned, when life is unexpected. Is he sovereign in this situation or is he not? And if he's not, then he's not sovereign at all. Not at all. And then we look and we say, well, God's sovereign over all things. Well, then the question is, is he good? And he's not good because of what he does for us. He's good because he's God. And so when we look at things, when life kind of turns sour, we have to ask the question then, well, is God good? And if he is good, then we have to trust that he has a purpose and a plan for everything that he does. And he does it out of a good heart, out of a good will out of good motives, or then we have to come to the conclusion that he's not good sometimes, which means he's not good at all. So think about that as we uh, read the verses that are in this psalm. Going to be familiar to you, the first part of it anyway. Psalm 46, 10 and 11. Let your doctrine be your guide is what we're talking about. Verse 10. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations, and I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. And then he ends the song with a Selah. Pause. Think about that. The idea might be don't run away from that too quickly, and don't say amen to that too quickly. Don't be one of those people who are just kind of glib about all of this. Be a thoughtful and considerate person when you are thinking about the things of God. And the first point that we want to uh, make is this. And each one of these are going to start with a, a word that begins with R. Okay? And the first one is reflect. Reflect. We need to stop and look in the mirror and look for a while, not just a passing glance, but a good, long, hard look at ourselves. Reflect. And then I've added to that, God, excuse me, your actions should display your belief. Your actions should display your belief. Now, if that's going to happen, then indeed we are going to have to do some reflection. We're going to have to ask, as the psalmist said, for the Lord to examine our hearts. Why is that important? Because my heart and your heart, they're tricky and they're deceptive. And there's sometimes my heart doesn't really show me what I need to see, but the heart can't fool God. And so God needs to be the examiner of my heart. Because sometimes my flesh will cooperate with my heart in telling me what a good person I am, and telling me that I've got it all together, and I must be pleasing to God. <coughs> but that's not always the case. In the New Testament, it says that we need to be careful that we're not like a person who looks in a mirror and then walks away and forgets what kind of person he was. You know, I, every once in a while you see some people in Walmart, let's pick on Walmart, and you wonder, did they even look in the mirror before they came out in public? And sadly, probably not, or it was just a quick glance. They really didn't pay attention, or they would have fixed some things. Sometimes you have a, a, a picture made, and it's a group picture, maybe of your family, and uh, when the picture is um, brought out to look at, or maybe later on when you get it printed to hang on your wall, then you notice, man, we should have looked a little carefully at ourselves. We're not arranged right. Maybe we're not dressed the way that we really want to be. Maybe our hair is still kind of messed up. Maybe there's somebody's collar that's turned up on one side. I mean, any number of things could happen because we get too hasty sometimes. And that's my point in uh, number one that comes out of this scripture. Be still. Stop. Be still. In fact, the idea there of be still is not chant or meditate or sit quietly in the dark or light a candle or anything like that. 
The word be still in the Hebrew literally means stop striving. Stop striving and know that I am God. If you um, have been around little children lately, especially babies, have you noticed how when it's time for them to go to sleep, what do they do? We were with uh, our youngest, Lottie Beth, and we were watching her and keeping her while Chelsea and Jeremy and Jenny and Isaac were at a retreat. And you know what we noticed about her? The sleepier she gets, the more restless and fidgety she gets. And you've kind of got a window of opportunity to put her down uh, or, or it's going to be rough. And you know what I've noticed? That's not unusual. And I noticed with our own children when they were uh, little, little, little bitty, they would fight sleep. What's the matter with you? You're tired? You're sleepy? What are you doing? Just lay back, relax, quit fighting it, and go to sleep. That's what this verse is talking about. When it says, be still and know that I am God, it's saying here, quit fighting against things you can't change. Quit fighting because you don't like the position that you're in. Stop striving with God and with your circumstances. And if you really believe that he's sovereign, then stop striving and remember who you're dealing with. That's literally what the verse is saying. Be still doesn't say anything in here about having quiet moments or a quiet time. That's not the thrust of it at all. Quit fighting. Quit striving. You're wearing yourself out. You're not getting anything done. You're not changing anything. And you find out that the truth of the matter is your striving, your panic, your fear, your scrambling to make something happen is really saying that you don't know God because God is in control and God is good. The little kid's prayer, remember, God is great, God is good. Those two things always are true. He's always great and he's always good. So you find yourself in a situation that you can't change and you wonder how you got here and you're blaming the devil and demons and everything else. What if it's God? What if it's God that has you in that situation? What if it is God that you're really fighting against? Well, this would be a good word for you. Stop it. Be still. And remember that he's God. Now, remembering that he is God means, number one, that he has authority over us. What are you trying to do? Fighting against him? Number two, it means that he is sovereign. You're not in this situation by accident. There's a reason God allowed you to be in this situation. And then number three, it means you need to wait on him. <clears throat> God has a plan, and that plan is not going to be altered. God has a purpose in all of this, and he's not going to let up until the purpose is met. And you'll remember that his purpose in you is to conform you to the image of his son. And it may be the very thing you're trying to get out of is the very thing that you need. It may be that the very thing you're trying to defeat and get rid of is the very thing that God has put into your life and allows in your life because that's the thing that is indeed going to make you like Jesus. So I would ask you, Graceway people, the ones who always affirm that God is sovereign, really? And do you live like it? Do you act like it? And have you ever reflected on that? Number two, write down the word relax. Relax. We were reflecting in point one, now we're relaxing. God will not allow his plan to be altered. God is not saying, is there a better way? God is not asking for our opinion about how he can improve. You know, um, I get these things sometimes where I'll make a phone call to an insurance company or something like that, or medical things. have been having a lot of that lately. And then the next thing I know, I'm getting a text message from them saying, how did we do? How can we serve you better? Your feedback is important to us, you know, and all of that. Do you know God never sends those out? Because... The truth of the matter is whatever God does is right and all of his ways are right and whatever he ordains is right. 
He doesn't need feedback because he doesn't need to improve. You see, when we think about God being an immutable God, an unchangeable God, sometimes we think that God is just maybe like us. He's just stubborn and doesn't want to change. Well, let me say back up just a little bit. God doesn't change because there's no need to change. You don't change when you're perfect. You don't change when you are excellent at everything and majestic and glorious in that. And so God has this plan. And notice he says, I will be exalted among the nations. Doesn't look like you're doing a very good job at it right now. Well, God's got a plan. And this sovereign God says, this is what's going to happen, whether the nations want it or not, and whether the nations like it or not. And this is going to happen regardless of what present circumstances may look like. Folks, I look at the world we're in right now, and I think about the fact that Jesus is going to return, and he is going to rule and reign upon this world. And people may fight it, people may not want it, People may think that's the worst thing that could ever happen. Boy, are they ever misguided. But the truth of the matter is, it is going to happen. And it may look like the world's in control, but they are not. It may look like the world is just descending down into who knows what. But the fact of the matter is, God is still in control. And when we look at our lives, and we look at our failures, and we look at our temptations, and we look at what other people do to mess us up or trip us up and all of those things, we have to relax sometimes because of who God is, we know that his plan is not being altered. It wasn't for Israel and it's not for us. And number three, the scripture calls upon us to rejoice. Why do we rejoice? Because regardless of the circumstances, think about this, God is not passive unclear or confused. Now we are. We get passive sometimes and we get apathetic. How many how many people were once on fire for God now, you know, they just don't really show up for church much and when they do it's with very little enthusiasm. What happens? Because that's the way humans are. We get passive about things. Oh, whatever will be will be, you know, just let it happen and uh, God never does that. Humans, a lot of times, are unclear. We don't even know what we think. I mean, just let a family try to decide after church where they're going to go eat dinner. And uh, I don't know, whatever is good until somebody suggests something. And then that person that says whatever says, well, not that place. And they are just unclear about something that ought to be very, very easy. Well, the truth of the matter is we're unclear morally. We're unclear socially and ethically. I mean, think about all of the things our society struggles with, and we don't know what to teach our children. We don't know what our children are really learning. We're not sure we really understand it all because we're living in a time where things are just really, really, really unclear. And then there's just confusion everywhere. Wear a mask. Oh, no, masks don't do any good. That's what we heard back in... Uh, February or March of 2020, but then it doesn't take very long. You must wear a mask. That's the only hope that we have, right? Um, All of these things are just so confusing. And you talk to one person and they read something about the coronavirus back in uh, April or May and that formed their opinion. Well, some of that has changed now more than a year later. And uh, what are we supposed to believe? Even my doctor told me that um, everything changes weekly with all of this stuff. So what they thought back at the beginning of 2020 is not what they think now. This disease is too new for anybody to really be an expert, isn't it? And I thought that is just such a good metaphor for life. There's so much confusion. There's not much that we really are settled on because we bought into the lie as a society that there are no absolutes And what's true for you may not be true for me. We don't have an objective truth. It's all subjective, depending on what we think and what we feel and where we are. And so we have situational ethics. I don't really have a strong ethical uh, principle that I live by. It changes with my situation, we might say. 
And all of this has done nothing but just confuse everybody on the planet until you go to God's word. Now notice that he says, I will be exalted among the nations, but he also said, I will be exalted in the earth. Not just here and there. When you have a nation, well, there's a lot of nations on the earth, and you can have plural by being exalted in two of them. And if God wants to be exalted in two of them, that's his business. But he also tells us here, he's not going to leave the world alone, that he is going to be exalted in the earth. Exalted every time we meet and gather and we sing praises to his name, he is being exalted on the earth. When other churches gather all around the world and they sing his praise and they hear his word proclaimed, he is being exalted. Whenever we obey him and we go against public opinion and we go against the conventional wisdom, he is being exalted. But I think there's also a time when he is going to come and he is going to really exalt himself. The second coming of Christ is so much different than the first advent of Christ. The first time Jesus came, he came in obscurity. The next time he comes, scripture says, every eye will see. The first time he came, he came as a little baby born in a stable and laid in a manger. The next time he comes, he's coming as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords riding a white horse. The first time he came, he came to be a servant. The second time he comes, he's coming to enforce his rule and reign upon the earth. And we could go on and on with all of that, understanding that God is not passive. I will be exalted in the earth. And he is doing that even now and setting up for what he has plans for in the future, even while we think he's not doing anything even while we may say, well, God just isn't moving and he's not answering prayer, don't do that. The, Jesus said that the Father is always at work and he's not passive, he's not unclear, his word tells us exactly what it is we're headed toward and he's not confused and changing his mind. That's a definitive statement, I will be exalted in the earth, like it or not, like it or not. And number four, the word is reaffirm. And we expand that by saying, God will not fail to keep his covenant. So the psalmist ends this thing by saying, the Lord of hosts is with us. Isn't that a good thing to think about? Well, it must have really been good for them to think about because God had a special covenant that he made with Israel. And there were times and let's be honest, mainly because of Israel's sins, when it didn't look like God was really keeping his end of the bargain. There were those times when, if you love us, why is this happening? I've told you before, I remember seeing a book back when I was doing youth work that said, if God loves me, why can't I get my locker open? Isn't that good? Well, can you imagine, what did Israel and Judah say? If God loves us, why are the Assyrians invading us? Why are the Babylonians invading us? If God loves us, why is the temple destroyed and plundered? If God loves us, why are we poor? If God loves us, and the Jewish people could ask this question in a variety of situations. If God loves us, why was Hitler allowed to do the Holocaust, for example? I mean, they have been persecuted more than any other people group on the face of the earth over the years. I heard the other day that there had been 19 Holocaust throughout history on the Jews, people trying to destroy them. Well, notice that it says the Lord of hosts is with us. We need to reaffirm, regardless of how we feel and regardless of what the circumstances are, regardless of who's in the White House or who's sitting on the throne in some other country, regardless of the economy, regardless of what's happening to us, the Lord of hosts is with us. He promised never to leave us or forsake us, and he won't because he always keeps his covenant. And remember, just as Israel had a covenant, the Davidic covenant, the Abrahamic covenant, those kind of things, we too have a covenant with God. Jesus told us on the night he was betrayed, 
take this cup and drink it, for it is the blood of the new covenant. And so our covenant with God is now in the blood of Jesus. It's kind of a one-sided covenant. He made it and he keeps it. It's done in his blood. This verse, the next half of it also says, the God of Jacob is our refuge. And I'm going to just point out something that may be painfully obvious, but sometimes it's the most obvious things that we sort of miss. You don't need a refuge when everything's going good. You don't need a refuge when everything is working right. And yet it says, the God of Jacob is our refuge. Why do they need a refuge? Because things don't always work the way you intended. Things happen that you didn't plan for. Life takes turns that you didn't anticipate. And yet, when it does that, guess what you affirm? The Lord of hosts is with us. And because he's the Lord of hosts, the God of armies, it means he has power. Brother, sister, he can change your circumstance anytime he wants to. And then the God of Jacob is our refuge. He's the place where you can run and hide. Maybe it's not his will to stop the storm yet. Maybe it's not his will to give you a shortcut out of the fire. But if your refuge is in the Lord, no matter the storm, no matter the battle, no matter the heat of the fire, whatever it may be, you're going to be okay and you're going to make it because you are in the shelter of the Lord. So, let your doctrine be your guide. All those things you say that you believe and that you affirm, those things you would fight for, those things you would argue about, those things you contend for, prepare to be tested in those things. When you tell other people, well, I believe that God is absolutely sovereign, get ready. You're going to have a time of testing to where that is going to be proven to be either true or false. You're either genuine or you're a fraud. One of those two things. Because I heard a preacher say one time back when I was in college, a faith untested is a faith that cannot be trusted. And so we want our faith to be tested and to be found to be genuine because it is based not on feelings, not on dreams, not on visions, not on the word of a preacher. Got to quit that, folks. We've got to go back and stand on the Word of God. The B-I-B-L-E, yes, that's the book for me. I stand alone on the Word of God, the B-I-B-L-E. And when you do that, then you make these statements, these affirmations, and God says, let's see if that's true. And when it comes out that it is true, you come out stronger and better and able to help and counsel and advise other people, and you're also able to worship God in a better way. So if your trials are stopping your worship from God, your faith isn't very strong, and it may be even suspect. So think about all of this, and think about what it really means. Let your doctrine be your guide. And then run to the Lord when you need to as your refuge. And give it a little Selah. You need to really stop and think about this. Hey, thank you for your time. May the Lord bless you. Continue to pray, and we'll look forward to seeing you on Sunday.